Welcome to the Queens of Moxie. I'm Mary Kay Campbell, the host of this program, and I'm so excited that you've decided to join us today. Every week, we bring amazing women to our podcast to talk about how they have stepped into joy and reclaimed their moxie and are living their authentic life. I want to get started, but before we do, I want to remind you to subscribe to the weekly email. Simply go to queensofmoxie.com and click on weekly inspiration. That way, every Monday morning, you'll get a link to the latest podcast, a beautiful image, and a fabulous quote. It's a great way to start out your week. So let's get started with today's podcast. Welcome to the Queens of Moxie. I am so excited, y'all. We have Sherry Taylor here with us today. And if any of you live in Charlottesville, you definitely know who Sherry is. Um, If you don't, you're going to figure it out really quickly. So I don't know if Sherry remembers this, but maybe eight years or so ago, she came and was a guest singer in the contemporary band at my church. And Mm -hmm. we sang together. And that's how we first met. And I'd been hearing her on the radio because she's a DJ for a long, long time. And, um, And so, you know, she was just awesome. She's an amazing singer. I am not. I bring life and joy through through my my expressions and my movement but I'm an okay singer and not a great no singer. that's not true you're a very good singer don't uh-huh. sell yourself short <laughs> you're very sweet um but Sherry is an amazing singer and and added so much to to the contemporary band and um like me she's she's more in that alto mezzo soprano range not in the mm-hmm. super high and so I loved it because I was like oh someone who can sing harmony with me because I you know <laughs> Um, but it's also been really funny because one time, I don't even know how many, maybe five, six years. I don't even know how long ago now we were, um, I took my kids to King's Dominion during, I think it was spring break or something. And right. you know, my kids know that I talk to everybody under the sun and I always know someone, no matter where I go and, and Sherry and I are talking and stuff. And then I said something about, oh, by the way, this is Sherry Taylor. And my son who was in high school goes, wait the sherry taylor (laughs) i was like yes from the radio and he was like so excited like local celebrity here Um, oh my gosh do you remember his reaction yeah i do it was it was super cute it was super yeah so uh so sherry has been in radio here in charlottesville for 30 years um which is just remarkable in and of itself she found out about it through when she was taking some classes at pvcc which is the community college here and it just put her right right into this role and um i love that she is even though she's kind of like west virginia tennessee kind of like this region (laughs) is where she's from yeah. She's been in Charlottesville since she's been 11. And so she is a local homegrown girl. And um, and so it's great that she is also a local celebrity here on our radio. Um, she has four children. Her stepson is 30. Her daughter's 27. The next in line is 22. And then she's got a senior in high school right now, um, which I have one of those as well. And mm-hmm. so I can appreciate where she is with that one, at least. And then my my oldest is uh, going to be 21 in June. So not not far from, from your youngest too. Um, and she's married to Chuck. And so what I wanted to do with Sherry is I said, will you be on my podcast? Uh, because <laughs> she offers such a unique and a wonderful perspective. So Sherry, Thank you. Thank you for being here. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks for asking. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I want to start with when you got started in radio, because a lot of industries, uh, particularly in media, tend to be male dominated. And uh, I would imagine that, ele- that you know, 30 years ago, radio was pretty heavily male dominated. How, how was that coming in as a 19 year old? Yeah, really interesting. I can tell you that. Uh, it, it was very male dominated. I want to say that everybody that I worked with at that time was male, with the exception of one person who did middays um, on the station where I worked. I didn't know that it was male dominated coming into it. Didn't even really think about it, to be perfectly honest. I just knew that I wanted to try this. And that's kind of the way I am. It's like, I, you know, I don't, I tend to, especially when I was younger, I ignore all the red flags. It's like, <laughs> oh, no, I'm not concerned about those things. Uh, I'm very laser focused into this is, I'm like, this is what I want to do. Um, and I was attending PBCC um, at the time. And um, 
yeah so it it was and and continues up until recently actually to be a very male dominated profession so what does that mean you know you got in not knowing and you know when we're young and naive there's a lot of things that we don't really understand the implications of how has that been growing your career in that kind of environment well <laughs> all right I I, I want to caveat this with, I recognize that you got to be sensitive because you're still in the radio and you're still working with those people. So, so everybody recognizes that, that, you know, you got to be sensitive to that as well. Yeah. You really had to, to adapt fast because back 30 years ago, okay. It's so different than it is now. Um, now there's HR situations back then there was none of that. It was everybody for themselves and um, in a male dominated profession, you had people constant, and I mean, and the fact that radio is very, most everybody that works there is very quick witted. Everybody mm-hmm. has to think on their feet. They have to come up with a joke. They have to, you know, and so that's just the nature of that whole, whole situation. But <laughs> when you're doing that with mostly men and you're, you're a young female, there's a lot that goes on there. So a lot of times I just had to let things go. Yeah. You know, I just had, I had to, I heard things and I was like, ha- probably half time. I didn't know what they were talking about. <laughs> Honestly, I think that's what saved me at the beginning. I had no, I was so naive, grew up in a preacher's, uh, I was a preacher's kid growing up. I didn't know anything. I, I didn't know dirty jokes. You know, they didn't, they didn't hit me. So I think I was insulated in that way because yeah. I could just kind of go, ha 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 and walk away. Right. And you know, and I didn't even really, it didn't hit me until later as I got older. And I thought, you guys are disgusting. Right. Um, but at that point, I knew them well enough that I just said, you guys are disgusting. You know, it was like, I didn't. Um, and and if they, and if it got too much, I would just kind of, um, kind of isolate myself a little bit, you know, to kind of get away from that. Yeah. So that's, it really honestly didn't bother me too much. Um, Cause like I said, I was uh, just kind of dumb. <laughs> when it came to things like that, you know, so I'm, I guess I'm kind of lucky in that way. (laughs) Well, you know, I think, I think a lot of us were at that point, you know, I look Mm -hmm. back on some of the things that were said to me by both men and women, but primarily men, but I had one boss who, um, I was engaged at the time and told me that my fiance couldn't come to, we used, I worked for the muscular dystrophy association. We worked with firefighters and they would go to bars and do boot drives where they would bring their boots around and get people to donate and very social event, you know, whatever. And she would tell me that my, my fiance at the time I'm, I'm divorced now, but that he couldn't come with me and that I needed to drink and flirt with the firefighters. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, I look at that now and I'm like, oh my goodness, I can't mm-hmm. believe I was told that, you know, and mm-hmm. that was literally her her mandate for me, you know, and, yeah. um, but that was I, very I commonplace happy about it, but, but I mean, but that's the thing. I think I'm glad that we've come a little bit further than that because that used to be so commonplace. It's just like, you know, you knew that if you went into the music business or if you went into, you know, to Hollywood and you tried to be an actor or an actress that you were going to get sexually harassed period. Yeah. And you knew that's what, and, and it was accepted. It was widely accepted. And I think that's kind of the way it was, you know, in my career in the beginning as well. Again, I say I was very fortunate. I worked with some really great people. A lot of those, a lot of those people um, are, I'm still very good friends with today. Um, these men that I worked with then, I mean, yes, they said, we, it, well, I'm sure we all said stupid and disgusting things. Right. But, um, but most of them actually have become really good friends and, and have apologized. I've had some of them apologize to me. Uh, for, they're like, man, I, you know, I can't believe some of the dumb stuff I said, you know, right. 20 years ago or 10 years ago or whatever it was. Right. So right. Um, they're like family now. And I mean, it's yeah. just like anything else, you know, people make mistakes. Well, and I don't know that there was, I'm sure that there wasn't a general understanding. Like when you say this, this is how it, you know, how it makes me feel or what's implied or, you know, people mm-hmm. think that they're being funny. And, right. Yes. And, you know, I think about some of, I, I think about some of the Saturday night live skits. I think about some of the like jokes that we had growing up that mm-hmm. now I would be horrified mm-hmm. you know, about. And, and so right. I agree with you. I'm very grateful that we have come such a long way and that we are much more aware and, and we have a long way to go, you know, and right. Yeah, that it, it takes time. 
you know, yes. no matter what. So have you, you do the morning shift, which, okay. For people who don't know, what time do you get up in the morning? Actually, you know what? It's changed over the years. Um, I, since I've come back, I, you know, with radio, I've come back and forth yeah. and uh, over the past 30 years, I've left it and I've come back. And so I left it about a year and a half ago right. again during the recession. And I said, you know, when they asked me to come back, I said, look, if I come back and I do mornings, I'm not getting there till six o'clock in the morning. And they said, okay. And so I said, okay, I can do this then. It used to be that I got up at 4 a.m. or even before that. And I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm up and out the door, right? 30 minutes, I'm out the door. I don't drink my coffee. <laughs> I drink my coffee on the way. I don't, I don't uh, have like a lot of lead time before I get to work. Mm -hmm. So it used to be that I'd get up around four, I'd be at work, you know, by five and I'd be there till one o'clock in the afternoon, something like that. Now it's more like I get up at five, I'm at work by six or a little before six. So it's, it's not too bad. Which is funny because probably most people listening go, oh my gosh, I can't imagine getting to work at six. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and that's true. But as for morning radio, that's actually really good. <laughs> it is. It is yeah. well because it's the drive time. And so you've need, you need to be there ready going when people get on the road and people get on right. the road early, you know? And so yes. that's, that's why. And, and I feel like drive time um, in morning in particular is the coveted time. Um, it's the, it's when most people are listening. So how did you move your way into these, these coveted positions? Wow. So I was working at Z95 where I am now, and I was, I had uh, gotten a part-time job there and I kept telling them, I'm like, look, I'm, I'm going to move into full-time at some point. They just didn't have any openings. So uh, eventually I, I did, I moved into afternoons and I would fill in for the morning guy sometimes when he would, when he was on vacation. And so um, I just, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. I was just going there and just do what I normally did. And uh, he, and he ended up leaving not long after I started doing that. And they said, Hey, you know, we like your sound. We like what you're doing in the morning. Would you be interested in trying out the mornings? And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> or, um, but my kids, my kids were little at the time. This yeah. was 12 years ago. So all the kids were at home. All the kids were little. My husband, I, I, so I had to have that discussion with my husband had to say, are you up for getting them to school every morning? Yeah. Um, so we had to make a pretty big, you know, lifestyle change. Right. And, uh, but he, he said, yeah, I mean, he works in the school system anyway. So he said, yeah, we'll do it. So we just, I just tried it out and mm -hmm. thankfully they let me try it out for a few months and then eventually gave me the job. Um, doing it part, uh, full time, um, permanently. That's so great. that was that's about twelve years ago. Yeah, 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 that's great. And and so I've always thought, you know, I think, and I don't know because I've never not worked in radio, but I think um, probably when you started, it was a lot more live. Like you're you're doing stuff and you're talking, you know, and now. It's a combination of live as well as you've queued up what music you're going to play at what time and what commercials. And, and so is it, is that accurate? Is it more automated now? I mean, you're still there, you're still answering questions and stuff, but how's that work? Yeah, that, that is accurate. When I started in 93, um, so the, everything was, yeah, somebody had to be there 24 seven. Right. And so I worked at 3WV, actually, the classic rock station. That was my first job. And they still played albums. Yeah. They had albums and CDs and eight tracks. Oh, so, gosh. Yes. So we had a combination. There was no automation whatsoever. So we had a combination of albums and, um, and CDs. And so you just had to pull your music for every hour and have it there, you know. And so all my anxiety dreams revolve around not having my music pulled out at the right time, being <laughs> dead air happening, you know, and so because yeah. there's so many elements going on, you had to push the commercials, you know, right. you had to put them all in and go, okay, what am I playing? What am I playing? And putting it all in. So that really was more, that's why they used to call you a disc jockey, right? Because you actually used to, to have to play records and yeah. those things, you don't have to do that anymore. That was also about the time automation was happening. Yeah. And so some stations, so the second station I worked at, um, 
what is now 99.7 country. Mm -hmm. I, I work, it was 102.3 country at the time. Okay. And uh, so I worked there for a little while and they had automation, which is this huge jukebox um, that was in the room. And so it, it, I did get a little bit of both worlds Yeah. when it came to that. So I was really happy that I did get a chance to do both. Uh, but now, yeah, now, I mean, everything's so automated that if we don't stop the automation, it will just keep going. And we nobody has to be there. So we just, you know, I don't have to set up any music. It's yeah. already there for me. It's already done. I just have to stop it when I want to talk. That's that's it's amazing. It is. I mean, I think about we were um for for those people for everybody listening today, I ran into you at um a crafting store uh, mm-hmm. on a Saturday. And right. um and we're gonna get into why you were there uh, in just a minute. But it was funny, you know, I standing there having this conversation with you, you go to the back to do to the, to the activity and I get in the car and I hear you on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. It's wild. <laughs> well, you know, and that's a thing because we have, we have so many events that we do and we have, it was the same thing. Like I had a last weekend, um, I had a movie that I was going to with listeners and they said, we literally just heard you on the radio on the way over here. I'm like, well, I'm technically there. Um, but that's that's one of the nice things about automation yeah. is that we can take we can take our Friday and record a Saturday show and we're we're there, you know, so that we're available for our listeners, but we don't have to actually be there um yeah. and work six and seven days a week, which is really nice. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. Sometimes I mean the list our listeners are hysterical you know and for the they're able to call me up and comment on something that we just said on on the air and I report it and then I'm able to have that conversation with them and they'll say something wild like somebody recently just said they can snap open an apple with their bare hands and I was like um okay I need to see that you know what I mean now you know I have the ability to say okay come to the station let's film this let's do this um and I could have, ne- I can't do that. I And I never even knew that was a thing. But right. having, you know, listeners call in and, and say these things, and then you can comment, you can put it back on the air. And um, there's just, you know, I, I at this point, there's no substitute for that. So tell me, what are some of the craziest things that you've heard or that you've experienced while working in the radio industry? Recently, where I had somebody call in, and he was talking about how he was looking for his girlfriend from 40 years ago and that his, his wife knew that he was looking for his girlfriend from 40 years ago. And, um, and she was the true love of his life and, and, oh. and, and right, right. So I have people that confess so much to me. Right? I mean, it's, it's like being almost like being a therapist or I yeah. imagine a bartender or something like yeah. that. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so we, we get a lot of that. So I turned 50 in May of last year. So I'll be 51 in just a couple of months, but you turned 50 in like a couple of weeks. And so not even right. No, two days in two in days. Two days. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Amazing. Welcome to the fifties. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> so I love the fact, you know, so Queens of Moxie is all about empowering women. It's all about stepping into joy and it's really the goal is to help women to go, I am awesome just the way I am. I am like, for me personally, I'm loud. I'm independent. Like my listeners are like nodding because I say this all the time, but it's true. Like if you want to know what I think about something, you're going to find out if you ask, I'm not going to (laughs) like sugarcoat it. I try to be a little gentler than I used to be, but you know, I mean, I, I like to say, you know, Moxie is all about chutzpah. It's, it's about, Mm -hmm. you know, owning who you are and I was in a really bad car accident two years ago, and that really shook me and helped Mm -hmm. me to realize that I am, I, I add value exactly how I am. Now we all have things that we work on, right? Like I'm not, I'm not saying that at all, but one of the things that I'd found myself doing was dimming my light, trying to conform and be quieter and smaller and less colorful because of the environment that I found myself in. And I've realized that you have to be sensitive to what's going on around you, but you also need to go where you're celebrated, not where you're merely tolerated. 
And mm-hmm. so for me, Queens of Moxie is all about helping women to, to figure out what it is that brings them the greatest joy and how can they be who they're supposed to be authentically and live in that space. Yeah. And I think that whether it's because we're in our, you know, fifties now, or because of COVID or because of, for me, my accident was certainly the catalyst, but um, I love the fact that you are saying I'm 50 and I'm going to celebrate it. And I'm going to celebrate it in a way that my listeners can benefit from it too. And so you, you created a bucket list of, of things that you wanted to do and you get to invite your listeners on this journey with you. So talk about what those things are and what you've done and, and what you've learned in that process of, of going to all these different things with, with listeners. Yeah. So I decided um, about six months ago, I said, Hey, I'm turning 50, you know, let's celebrate, let's get listeners involved. And so um, I went to the sales department and I said, Hey guys, you know, what can we do? These are some things that I want to do. You know, I wanted to zip line. I wanted to um, uh, snow tube because it, I, a lot of things I haven't done in my life. And and a lot of that, I think I'm at a point now where these things that I've never done before that I've always wanted to do, you know, I, my kids were little and all this stuff. Well, now that they're all getting older and I don't have that particular responsibility, I'm like, now is my chance to kind of check off some of those things on the bucket list, even though they're sim- they seem simple to a lot of people. So I said, but I don't want to do it by myself. I said, I want listeners to have a chance to do this as well, because, you know, I, I, I think, I, I don't know what you'd call it, but I, I don't, I'm not the kind of person, I don't like to just go up and say, hey, look what I'm doing. And guess what you're not going to be doing this weekend, but I'm going to be doing it. You know what I mean? And so right. I, I don't typically, you know, talk about things that I do when I'm not on the air. Um, but but I said, well, but if I bring listeners with me, then we can have some fun. I can highlight these local businesses, yep. you know, um, cause a lot of them have never advertised with us before. And I'm like, I can, I can highlight those businesses and, and support local. I can bring listeners along and they can have a chance to have some fun as well. Maybe they're feeling the same way I am, yeah. you know, and, uh, and we can do it together. And so that's kind of where we started with it. Um, we were supposed to go snow tubing, but uh global <laughs> warming <laughs> no so we didn't get to do that i'm still gonna do it i'm gonna wait yeah. till like november yeah. um but I, i'm gonna do it Good. and uh so we didn't get to do that but we did get to go to where i saw you at the scrappy elephant yes um which Sarah's they used place. to be out here in fluvanna um sarah's so sweet yeah. and so they agreed to let us come and craft for an afternoon um, so that was one of the things that we did at the Scrappy Elephant. That's where we saw each other. And then we also went to dinner at um, Inca Peruvian Grill, which was, I had this mushroom risotto, which was absolutely amazing. Right. Met so, And this is the other thing. I've met so many wonderful people, you mm-hmm. know, that I would not normally have met. And no one's more surprised than me that they want to go to these things with me, you know? <laughs> And I'm just, I'm so excited. You know, I'm just like, oh, you know, I'm so excited. You want to go, let's go, let's go have some fun. Yeah. And um, so we went and we had a meal. We went to a movie last Saturday to see Shazam. Violet Crown was really uh, nice and uh, allowed us to come in and do like a private viewing nice. of that movie. And and I got to meet a lot of uh, wonderful people for that event. Oh, we went to Reba McIntyre. Oh, uh, she puts on an amazing show. That was an incredible show. Um, so, so we got to go to that show and we got to go there by limo. Um, so we missed all that crazy traffic that was there. <laughs> yeah. Um, so those are just a few of the things. And tomorrow is the last event because we're doing five events for 50. Right. One for each decade. And tomorrow we're doing um, axe throwing. We're going to, I've always That's wanted to right. do that. Yes. We're going to throw axes and we're going to do an escape room at yeah. Boar's Head Outfitters. Yes. I yeah. remember thinking, oh, I want to sign up. And then, you know, I'm. I never did. You didn't sign up. <laughs> I wish I could do all the things that are on my like would like to do list. It yes, doesn't happen. But I think axe throwing sounds so fun. Well, we're gonna find out tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm so excited for you. And I mean, just how delightful to to not be like, oh, I'm turning fifty, you know, and and like so many people get upset about it and and get back black balloons and stuff, you know. 
when I turned 50, I went, I, I had a wonderful friend who has this gorgeous home. Like it's huge, um, out at the Outer Banks and she let us use it for the, for a long weekend. She couldn't make it, but, um, like six of my friends, my closest friends and I went to the beach for a long weekend and mm -hmm. it was such a powerful, amazing celebration. And mm -hmm my birthday was the excuse to go. Yeah. I mean, it really, it really was, but like, it was a transformational weekend because I was the common thread with all of these women, but a lot of them had never met anybody before or knew one person or, you know, and so we all got together and, and unfortunately one of the women's, her father was, was really sick. And we knew that he was nearing the end and he passed while we were there, but what was so powerful was before she left, we went down by the pool and we laid our hands on her and we, we, we prayed over her and we, we bolstered her up and, you know, people just had tears running down their face, um, because it was, you could feel the solidarity and the power of, of loving and supporting someone, yes. you know, and, um, you know, some, one of the women, um, had had a lot of experiences with mean women. Um, you know, mean girls, unfortunately grow up to be mean women and was really, really nervous about coming. And because she just had so many bad experiences and luckily another friend that she knew came and, and brought her along and she was in tears. Like I never knew I could have friends, you know? And yeah, that's so um, sad, isn't it? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Does yeah. that not break your heart? I mean, it does. Yeah is it's it's oh and and I adore her she's amazing and and so you know I think that if we can celebrate these milestones and you know in your case do these things that you've always wanted to do and bring others along and and have this celebration that's how we should be looking at life you know as well oh. as opportunity yes absolutely I mean and this is just an opportunity you know here's the thing about what I do you know I, I'm so privileged to do this job. And I'm so privileged to be in the position that I'm in. And I, I don't think that I realize that as often probably as I should, but you know, my thought, I just, I just pray that God puts me where he needs me every single day and that whoever needs whatever it is I have can hear it, you know, and it's not that I have anything special. It's just that, um, you know, I just want people to to have that few minutes, even if they're only, it's a 20 minute drive to work, you know, and they have to drive. I just want them to feel like they're, they're wanted and loved and that somebody else, you know, would listen to them. And cause not everybody has that. And that is very sad because I grew up in a wonderful family. Um, I have a wonderful family, you know, now of my own. And so, you know, it just, it's, it's very, very, it's just very sad to me that there are people that don't. And so, that little, whatever I can give, whatever little piece of, of some sort of, you know, um, comfort that I can give, you know, on a daily basis in what I do. And, you know, um, that's, that's what I'm here for. That's really what it's all about at this point in my life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because I funny? think I'm 50 and that's, that's the way funny. it goes when you get older. Right. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that's, I think it's such an important part for us to, to reckon with is that, you know, it, when I have my youngest is going to be 18 next month. And I remember being 18 and I remember the insecurities of it. And, oh. and, um, and I think, Oh God, I'm so glad to be 50. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad I don't care what people think anymore. You know, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, I think you realize as you get older, like people are not thinking about you as much as you think they are. <laughs> Bingo. Bingo. Yes. Yes. We're all, you know, you think about our, our worlds, there are millions of individual worlds that are revolving every single day, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, well, billions on the planet. But if you yeah. think about just the Charlottesville kind of yeah. surrounding area, you know, there's a uh, hundred thousand different little worlds that are going on in this area. And we're all, it, it, it's, that to me is exhausting. And it's yeah. like, it's hard enough just keeping track of this one, you know what I mean? And I can't imagine <laughs> So yeah, it is. I think that people, we, we put w way too much weight on what other people think of us. Yeah. You know, I'm at a point now where, and my family knows this, I'm like, I'm sorry, 
if you have a problem, it seems like that's your problem. Um, I'm, I, you know, I mean, I'm not trying to be ugly about it. I'm just, uh, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be realistic Yeah. and I'm trying not to put that on me because I think as moms yes. and as women, we yes. take everybody's problems and yes. we, oh my gosh. And we just, and the guilt and the, everything that just kind of, you know, culminates and I want everybody to be happy all the time. Yeah. And you want them to, to always feel loved and warm. And I'm like, you know what? And my husband and I have this conversation a lot lately. And I said, you know what, honey? I said, I can't make you happy. You know that, right? And he says, yeah, I know. And I said, so if something's bothering you, I may be able to help you in some way, but ultimately <laughs> you're going to have to make yourself happy. I can't do it for you. And same thing with my, it's the same thing I tell my kids. I'm like, look, yeah. I can't make you happy as much as I would love to make you yeah. happy. Um, I said, I have a hard time making myself happy. So right. there's no way I can do it for you, you know? Um, and I think if we just, uh, we're there to help facilitate others, yeah. women that are in a position like your friend was who hadn't had a good female relationship, you know, in those relationships to just lift each other up and to just support one another. And you know what? If you're a mom that does does your mom in this way and you're a mom that does your mom, we've got to stop hating on each other, know. you know? And and like it, it it's it starts with the whole, you know, as soon as we rear our children, as soon as they come out, are you gonna breastfeed or are you going to bottle feed? Well, you know what? It doesn't matter. Are you gonna feed your kid? That's the important question. Right. Right. <laughs> if you are, then I think we're good. Yes. Because <laughs> if you're not, then we have a problem. Yeah. Um, but yeah. other than that, you're feeding your kid good mom, you know, you're doing, right. you're doing great. And we need to tell women that they're doing great, yes. that they're doing fine, that, that who they are is just fine. And we have to tell our, we have to look at ourselves and say the same thing and say, you know what, Sherry, you know what, Mary Kay, you're doing all right today. You're fine. You're good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, it's so true. And, you know, I often say, would you talk to a friend the way you talk to yourself? Mm, and and yeah, often my answer is I wouldn't even talk to my enemies that way. Like, right. You know, like right, yes. I don't, I don't really have enemies, but like the people I don't like in this world <laughs> wouldn't talk yeah. to that way. Why, yeah. why do we talk to ourselves that way? And it's yes. that inner voice and, you know, you spend the most time with yourself, yep. like what's going on in your brain is uh -huh. what you're, is that record you're hearing over and over and over again. And so often we have to stop that, that record and, and change it and, and, and yes. start to look at, you know, there's all kinds of research about being grateful. If you yes. find yourself in that situation, stop and find something that you're grateful for. Yeah. Or if something's really upsetting you stop. And again, research shows being mindful of what's my physiological reaction to this is my, is my stomach mm -hmm. flipping? Am I clenching my jaw? Am I clenching my fists? Am I raising my shoulders? If you're doing those things, stop, look out the window at the sky or pet an animal or look at the picture of your child when they're, they were a baby or whatever it is that brings you joy and, mm -hmm. and notice those physiological changes in your body. And so if we can, we can stop ridiculing ourselves. And when we do it, re rewrite that. I mean, there's this whole I can't remember what it's called, but it's this whole cognitive therapy programming where you basically rewire your brain when you, you break those, those cycles and you rewire it to have a new neural pathway so that you, you know, your body, your muscles, your brain, everything doesn't hold on to that anymore because we do, we hold it all in our body and our muscles. Oh yeah. You know? And so, and I, and I know as women, we are so much worse about beating ourselves up than, than men are. I mean, it's yes. scientifically proven. It's horrible. Yes. It is. And it's in every little thing, you know, you can't beat yourself up over every little thing. And I, I think that we do, we tend to do that a lot. And it's going to take, it takes a while to reprogram your brain. It took you, it took us what, 50 years to get to this point. Yeah. And, and all of the, the negative self-talk. And, and so don't be so hard on yourself. And so when, when Mary Kay goes on a trip and I'm like, Mary Kay, I'm so, I'm so happy for you. That's awesome. I've had to, I've had to make myself, um, say those things out loud to other people so that I can then say those things to myself. You know what I mean? And so when I get to go on a trip or if I get to go throw us some axes with some people, I'm like, you know what, Sherry, 
I'm happy for you. That's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I think we have to say that to ourselves. There's there, what's the, what is the point of being ugly to ourselves? What is the point of that? There, Nothing. It, it's self-defeating. IBS. I can tell you what's going to happen. You're going to get IBS. <laughs> You're going to get anxiety. You're going to get depression. Uh, and I have all those things. Um, and, and so we're, at this point in my life, it's another health, you know, a health journey, physical and mental health right. to kind of, to, to kind of unwind. I'm really good at, you give me Christmas lights. I'm going to unwind those suckers. It's going to take me a while, but I'm going to do it. I can do that with my, my mental health and my physical health. As well. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there've been a couple guests on, on the podcast that talk about these things. So Britta talks about emotion body code where you know, you're holding those things in your, your body physically. And it's, it's a whole process of, of releasing those and letting them go. Um, there, uh, Ariel talked about mental health and how being kind is such an important thing, being kind to yourself, being kind to others and recognizing when you need help and getting it and not being ashamed of it. Um, mm -hmm. I'm really happy that as a society, we're starting to talk about it more and we're starting to really acknowledge that this is this is a and this is a reality a lot of us i mean i take i take lexapro i have generalized anxiety and i am yes so glad that i have that as a resource because i'm a much happier person and yeah. you know I've, I've i've shared this with many people that you know it's it's your your brain is firing and the receptor is here and it's firing, 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 but the chemicals aren't there to make the pathway. And that's mm -hmm. what the medication does. It just creates the pathway. Right. And, and so you're missing a chemical in your brain. That's you're putting it back in there. It's supposed yeah. to be there, you know, but, but as a society, we've, we've created this stigma around it. And, um, and I, I think that's just so sad because people for the longest time, weren't getting the help they need. And even still people aren't. And, um, you know, I, I did hear that we have more counselors and psychologists and uh, social workers per capita than, than most major metropolitan areas, but it's hard to get an appointment because we are one of the most um, mental health aware communities. And so people are utilizing the services, which is fantastic. Yes. Yeah, it is. And, you know, I think with mental health, I think that what I've realized is that people who don't suffer from with mental health issues, you know, or anxiety or depression or anything like that, they find it really hard to be sympathetic mm. um, to people that do. And I, I think if you don't, just because you don't suffer from something, you know, I didn't break my leg, but it's not hard for me to be sympathetic to someone who did, because now you can't use your leg, you know, or you might need help getting in and out. Well, even though you can't see what might be happening, because women are really good at masking it. Yes. We're really good at like, no, I'm fine. Everything's good. Every, you yep. know, everything's yep. good. And that's, I think that's why we get to the point where we are um, because we, we push it and push it you know, and you start binge eating and you start doing all these things to just kind of push those feelings down because you're not supposed to have those feelings, you know, and, um, and I, I did a lot of that. I mean, a whole lot of that and I'm done. I'm not, you know, I'm like, nope, I'm going to tell you exactly. How I'm feeling right Absolutely. Now. <laughs> and we're going to work this out. And I, I, cause I don't, I do not ever want to feel that way again. I think right. you get to a point where it's like, I don't want to be, I don't want to feel like that. That's miserable, you yes. know? So how can I change that narrative? Yes. Um, and I think we just have to, we have to be supportive yes. of one another. We're so divided. We're so, you know, if you don't believe this or you don't believe that and know. you know, it, it's, it's too complicated. Yeah. That's so yeah. complicated. Why are we complicating life? That's what we're doing. And I um, I, I'm done with it. I'm sorry. I'm done with complication. <laughs> I'm yeah. done with with being angry, you know, angry at things. I'm just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm here for it. Whatever, yeah. you know, all the good stuff. Yeah. Bring it on. <laughs> and, and you know what, Sherry, when, when you reach that point in your life where you're like, okay, you know what? That's really not working for me. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And, and, yeah. um, you know, I'll never forget my counselor, you know, I got divorced 15 years ago, but when my counselor said to me, you leave when the pain of staying is worse than the pain of leaving. Mm. And I, I will always remember that because she was right. Like, yes, it is hard 
to make changes, whether for me, it was getting out of an, an abusive marriage for, for somebody else that's getting the help that they need for mental health or, or changing the, the internal dialogue, whatever it is, it's hard, but you do, you get to a point where you say, I, I really want something different and mm -hmm. it's going to be, it's going to be work to get to the other side, but it is worth it. You and know? you are worth it. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. 100%. 100%. Yeah. I don't know how we got onto that from radio, but here we are. And, you know, because I have worked in, in public relations my entire career and, and I interviewed thousands of people, I know, and you know this too, because of what you do, when you let a conversation develop organically, you end up finding out the real essence of, of somebody and the, and the real story. And so it may not be where you initially started, but it's where you end up is where you're supposed to go. Yeah, it really is. And so, you know, I always tell people like, people are like, will you send me the questions in advance? I'm like, I, I, I don't write out questions. Yeah. I, I know I'm the same idea, way. Yeah. But... I don't usually write them out either. I'm just, we're just going to talk about what you've got going on and see where we go. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and here's, here's a, a prime example. So when I used to work at the university of Virginia medical center, I was the editor of, of the employee newsletter and I was writing a story about a, tr the transitional care hospital was opening. And so that's a hospital that is for acute level care for people who maybe are going to be in the hospital for longer periods of time. So you, you've been in a bad accident, you're on a respirator, we're working on getting you off that respirator, but it's going to take a couple of weeks to get you there kind of thing. And, and so we were about to open it and the nurse that I was going to interview um, needed to wait because she was going on vacation. So no problem, you know, shuffle stories around, whatever. So when she got back, I interviewed her and talked all about the TCH and, you know, whatever. And then after the interview was done, I said, oh, how was your vacation? And and she was like, it was okay. I was like, well, that didn't sound very good. And, and it turns out that on the flight home, Jackie, well, a, a man in his mid fifties went into cardiac arrest. Oh. And Jackie was the only medical provider on the plane. And she administered CPR to this man for 15 minutes while they made an emergency landing and saved his life. Oh my goodness. Wow. And she said that wasn't a good vacation. <laughs> like I saved somebody's life on vacation. Oh my gosh. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, I guess. But I imagine you know, it was very stressful. <laughs> yes. She yes. said, you know, you're in a very sm small space. Giving CPR is extremely exhausting. It's very physical. You know, 15 minutes is a long time to administer it. Um, and yeah, you know, his wife is sitting right there and, you know, and, but my point of this is that the, the interview was done. I, I was writing the article about the TCH. Yeah. That are that ended up being another article and it was called Rescue in Mid Flight. Uh, that yeah. was the story. Yeah. That was what I needed to hear and what all the readers needed to hear was, oh my God, this amazing person, this angel in flight, you know, that didn't yes. want any, like she wouldn't let me use her last name. Like she did not want recognition, you know, for her, she was doing what anybody would do if you're clinically trained to do that. And while I understand that perspective, I also am like, no, no, that's really amazing. Yeah, no, it is. And it's, and it's not necessarily what everybody would do. Right. You know, that's what, that's what I hear a lot. You know, I hear, you know, oh, well, isn't this what anybody would do? And they're like, no, actually it's not what anybody would do. Yeah. So the fact that you step out and you do something like that is amazing. And, um, and, and because you don't always know if somebody else, maybe there was somebody else who was a medical professional and they just didn't know it because they wouldn't speak up. You know yeah. what I mean? Right. She was the right. only one that stepped forward. So right. good, right. good on her. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but, but again, went down that track because that's where the conversation led. And, and, yeah. you know, so I, I'm grateful that you talked about this because I think it's really important for everybody to hear that they're not alone. Yes. You know? Yeah, that that's 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 really my focus in life these days. Is you know what? Look, it does whatever you're doing, like whatever you're, wherever you're going right now. You know, and I think we're so critical. We're so critical of everybody. You know, if 
again, like I said, if you're not you know, thinking the way that I'm thinking, if you don't have the same religion that I have, or you have no religion, or you have this, or you have that, and and it's just like, you know what, that's that's not, that's not what, yeah. that's not what we're here for, you know, yeah. we're here to support people, and to love on people, and to, um, to show them what it's like to be a decent human being. Yeah. Yes. By being one. By being one. See <laughs> yeah. by example. Exactly. Yep. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So that's, that's my whole goal. I love it. I love it. <laughs> so at the end of every podcast, I ask the, the guests, if you had to give one piece of advice to the listeners today, what would that piece of advice be? Oh, wow. Um, I, I think there's so much. <laughs> Yes. There's like, so, there's so much, um, but understanding that your journey is a journey. Mm. You are not, I am not the person today that I was 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. I want to say that the human body, our, our cells restore themselves every seven years. Mm -hmm. I'd say that's about right. Mm -hmm. I'd say I have been a different person every seven years. Um, and so the person that you are today, maybe you're looking at your circumstances, maybe you're looking at what you've got going on and you're thinking, oh man, is this ever going to end? I can tell you that it will. It, it you know, we've, we've had so many stressful periods in our life, in our marriage, with our kids, with family, you know, friends, and you always think, is it ever going to get better? And, um, Yes, eventually it will get better, uh, but you don't be so hard on yourself. Don't be so hard on yourself. Um, it's it's you're going to get to the other side of it, and if you're lucky enough to live till you're 50, 60, 70, 80 years old, embrace it and and enjoy it because you know what the alternative to not turning 50 <laughs> yep. and not turning 60, it's not as good. I can tell you that your life is a journey, so just you know, go with it. It's going to change. It's going to ebb and flow. Sherry, thank you so much for your time. It has been so wonderful to talk with you. I, I feel like I'm just so excited. I'm like a little kid. I'm like, oh, yay, we got to talk to Sherry today. <laughs> uh, but I, I really do. I appreciate it so much. And I know our listeners are getting a lot out of what you've shared today. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And it was fun talking to you too. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us on the Queens of Moxie podcast. I hope that you found it inspirational and that it helps you to think about how you can step into joy and live your authentic life. And remember, we have a weekly email so that you don't miss any of these episodes. Plus, it starts your Monday out with an inspirational quote and a beautiful image. If you haven't subscribed yet, go to queensofmoxie.com and hit, click on weekly inspiration. Thanks again for joining us and we'll see you again next week.